I'm going to give uh, a bit of a, just an overview, an introductory talk about biodynamic craniosacral therapy. Um, and I'd like to be able to include uh, just a practical exercise as well um, that we can do a little bit later. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the training and what is involved in training in this field. And I've already been sent a long list of questions and I hope I'm gonna have a chance to get through all of them, if not most of them, if not all of them. Um, and, uh, but I'm also really happy if you've got questions as we go along that you can write them in the chat box. And also at certain times, I'll just open up for your feedback and we can uh, dialogue directly as well. Um, so um, that, um, that's the plan for this evening. So uh, we've got uh, Esther is here online. Esther is our administrator and she's going to monitor the chat box for questions and, uh, and can just read those out if you don't want to come online directly. So I'm going to do some screen sharing now and start by um, talking to you a little bit about the history and development of craniosacral practice. The work really goes back to uh, an osteopath who was in his uh, studying in the very first school of osteopathy around uh, the turn of the 20th century. And um, as a final year student, was in his college laboratory examining a set of disarticulated cranial bones. And you can see this is a picture of him here uh, next to a model of disarticulated cranial bones. And he was looking at the, um, the design of the joints within the cranium, which are specialized joints called sutures. And he was looking at some of the design of these sutures, and he had basically a, a kind of a revelation. This is one of the bones that he was looking at. It's called the temporal bone, and it's at the side of the head. And he was looking at this kind of beveling that is present within the suture, within the joint of the cranium. And he had this insight, which he described quite poetically. He said, a thought struck me like a blinding flash of light that these bones are beveled like the gills of a fish designed for a respiratory movement. Okay, now that's a pretty strange thought perhaps to come in to your head. These bones are beveled like the gills of a fish designed for some kind of respiratory movement. So he was examining the sutures and looking at the skull. The skull consists of over 100 different articulations. And he thought to himself, why would nature design a skull composed of over 100 different articulations if there was not some kind of physiological purpose for that? So anyway, he took this idea back to his college tutors uh, and, uh, you know, proposed to them perhaps these joints were actually designed for motion. And they kind of dismissed him. They didn't really pick up on his idea. So uh, he didn't really get any satisfactory answers from them. So he decided to do some experimentation on himself. He couldn't get this idea out of his head that somehow that the bones of the head are designed for movement. They're not designed to be static. So he designed, he, he built a, um, a very strange helmet-like contraption that he put on his head which consisted of bandages and leather straps 
that he could tighten up in various directions with a view to preventing motion from taking place. And his reasoning was that if there was such a thing as cranial movement, and if it could be possible to in some way restrict that movement, it should be possible to experience or measure the consequences of that. So he put this helmet on his head and tightened up the straps. You can imagine this scene. He was a final year student in his osteopathic school. He was at the first school of osteopathy that was set up by the founder of osteopathy, Dr. Still. And he was walking around his college campus uh, wearing this great big helmet with this uh, leather straps tightened up in various directions. And to his surprise, he started to experience symptoms that he didn't previously have, and symptoms that he just could not explain away in terms of pressing just the superficial nerves or the superficial blood vessels in the head. He started to get sleeping difficulties or digestive problems. Then he would undo the straps, tighten them up in another direction, and then another set of symptoms would uh, develop. He would, he would maybe go through a period of depression or, um, uh, or disorientation or symptoms that were just not typical for him. So this really uh, showed him that um, whatever it is, there must be some such thing as cranial movement, and it must have some kind of physiological purpose. Now, this was in the year 1900, 1901. Dr. Sutherland passed away in 1954, and he basically spent the 50 years remaining of his life investigating into what could be these, this phenomena of movement, of subtle movement that he so, you know, he had this kind of insight into, uh, and then um, that seemed to be proven by these experiments that he did on himself. And um, he also, as part of his osteopathic training, had developed quite a, a finely tuned sense of touch, of palpation. Palpation is the art of being able to sense through the hands. And he found that he could put his hands onto his patient's heads and feel the presence of subtle movements that hadn't been previously described, at least not in the standard physiology textbooks that were available in the West. Interestingly, in some other cultures, they had spoken about movements that take place, subtle movements that take place in the body. And what's more, he also started to be able to identify areas that may not be moving so freely, places that might in some way be restricted. Um, so um, he then really made a further study of this. He, he, he put his hands on all of his patients for, for many, many years. And he also came to a conclusion quite early on that not only must there be such a thing as cranial movement, but also this movement is not isolated to the cranium. Um, there is uh, a system of, uh, let's say, anatomical relationships at the core of the body that all function very closely together. The cranial bones is on the outside of the head and he discovered that there is such a thing as movement and mobility, motility at the cranial bones. But he also 
identified that the membranes that underlie the bones and that partition the different areas of the skull, those also express motion. And also the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord itself also expresses movement. And not only that, but the fluid that surrounds the central nervous system also has a subtle movement, as does the sacrum at the base of the spine. So he identified these sort of sometimes called five phenomena or five aspects that all function very closely together. There is the movement of cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid that bathes the central nervous system, but also interpenetrates the central nervous system. There is the movement of the central nervous system itself, that is the brain and the spinal cord. There's also the movement of the membranes that partition the brain and also surround the spine, uh, the spinal cord as it goes down into the spinal canal and down to the base of the spine. There is the movement of cranial bones, and there is also the movement of the sacrum between the pelvic bones. And he called this system the craniosacral mechanism. So this is where the term craniosacral comes from, to denote this system of anatomical and physiological relationships uh, at the core of the body. But he also identified at a very early stage that these subtle movements that he first identified within the cranial bones are actually a whole body phenomena. So they are not just restricted to these five phenomena at the core of the body. They involve the fascia, they involve all of the organs of the body, the muscles, all of the fluids of the body. So everything in the body is moving and expressing a subtle breathing rhythmic motion. And Sutherland, um, found that he could put his hands on, identify where these subtle movements were happening, in other words, where this kind of natural intrinsic motion was taking place through all of the tissues and the fluids of the body, and where there may be some kind of restriction um, that was um, uh, being held within the body. And he started to develop a whole series of skills and techniques to help to um, restore the natural movements within the body in places where they were getting restricted. Now, in the early days, his techniques were quite directive. They, we call them biomechanical techniques. He would do subtle manipulations on the body and he would adjust things and try to move things to get things going. But as I'll, as I'll explain shortly, he actually um, refined his uh, skills over the many, many years that he was investigating this work. Um, and in the end, uh, you know, he basically um, was using skills which were very non-invasive, but skills that really cooperate with the body's natural restorative and healing capacities. So he started to treat patients and was getting fantastic results. He um, uh, developed quite a reputation as actually the doctor to whom other local doctors would send people to, um, particularly their very difficult patients who they had no idea of uh, how to treat, but they knew that this guy, William Sutherland, was doing something unusual but getting good results. Well, let him try and see what he can do for these people. And he was getting some fantastic results and started to 
um, get a, a kind of a reputation of people who wanted to come and be treated by him, as well as people later on who wanted to study with him. One of the questions uh, that he asked himself at a very early stage of his investigations is, uh, well, what is it that is actually generating these subtle movements? So he'd identified, first of all, through his self-experimentation, the fact that there must be such a thing as cranial motion and that it must have some kind of physiological function because when you press or stop it or restrict it, the physiological effects can be quite widespread. Um, and he also, as I mentioned, discovered that um, this phenomena is not just um, restricted to the cranial bones, it is actually a whole body phenomena. Uh, and it has a physiological function throughout the body. Whenever the uh, fluids and tissues of the body are able to express their subtle rhythmic breathing to their fullness and full capacity and balance, there is a state of good health. But where there can be some kind of holding or restriction or inertia present within the body, this seems to link to the presence of clinical symptoms, pathologies and diseases. And when uh, he was able to restore these normal movements, he found that his patients were getting better. So one of the things that he identified from an early stage is that these rhythms are somehow, these subtle movements are somehow critical for optimal health. That if everything in the body is uh, expressing its natural subtle motion, uh, then everything can function well and we're in a good state of health. When we restore these subtle movements within the body, health comes back. Okay. So he realized that there must be some kind of organizing principle that is expressed in the body through its subtle rhythmic motions. So he asked himself this question, well, what is it that is producing these subtle movements? Now, this is something that is still uh, being debated within our profession, but Sutherland considered many different possibilities. He thought, well, maybe this subtle rhythmic movement is in some ways driven by the movement within the central nervous system. Um, I'm just going to let somebody in. Hold on a second. There's um, somebody waiting to come into the room. Um, why can't I do this? Um, okay, that's strange. Okay. Um, just bear with me a moment. Okay, I think that's done. Um, so um, he thought, first of all, well, maybe this is in some way driven by a movement that takes place within the central nervous system, by the brain, by the spinal cord, and from the central nervous system, in some way, it's spreading out and affecting the whole body. Then he thought, well, maybe it's a combination of a number of different factors. Maybe it's relating to lung breathing and muscular activity, um, and that in some way that there is some kind of um, synchronization of different rhythms that are present within the body that generate what's called a harmonic rhythm. And he thought maybe this might be the case. And he thought about 
different possibilities for what it is that might be um, producing these rhythmic motions. And after a number of years of investigation, he came to a conclusion that is quite simple, by no means simplistic he realized that these rhythms are primarily driven by nothing other than the life force itself. Now, this is a phenomenon that is recognized in many traditional forms of medicine. We know, of course, in Chinese medicine, we talk about um, uh, vital force or chi. In Ayurvedic medicine, similarly, um, there is a reference to uh, a subtle um, uh, energy that is uh, expressing through the body. And Sutherland used a term to describe the source of this subtle energy. He took a term from the book of Genesis, um, and he referred to it as the breath of life. And his conclusion was that it is none other than the life force itself that is essentially driving these subtle rhythms. Um, and he came to a conclusion that it is, and this is a very similar conclusion that is present within Chinese medicine, that the life force, the breath of life, becomes expressed within the fluids of the body. And he paid particular importance to the role that cerebrospinal fluid plays in this process. And that as everything in the body is fluid, including bone, bone is primarily very fluidic. It's uh, living bone is nothing like the dried up uh, tissue that we examine once it's, uh, once it's dead. Um, every organ, every muscle, every fiber within the body is essentially fluid. And Sutherland came to the conclusion that there is some kind of life principle which is expressing through all of the fluids of the body that is essentially driving this subtle system of rhythmic motion and rhythmic breathing. And that these subtle forces, these vital forces are carrying, as I mentioned before, um, an organizing principle into the body that keeps everything in a state of good health, of vitalization, of regeneration. And when all of that is functioning well, the tissues of the body function well, the body-mind connection continuum functions well, everything is okay. But where there is some kind of restriction or inertia, those vital forces are no longer able to express and disease and pathology is the result. In the early days of his investigations, he identified a particular rhythm that he referred to as uh, the cranial rhythmic impulse. Now, this is a chart, it's from my book, um, and um, I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview of this chart um, and, and pick up on some of the main phenomena that Sutherland and others have identified. So, um, as I say, he started by identifying this rhythm that you can see at the bottom of the chart called the cranial rhythmic impulse that expresses around eight to 12 cycles a minute. That means that each minute, the um, in, a, in, in the rhythmic movement, there is like a, a breathing out and a breathing in, and that happens around eight to 12 times a minute. So this is a great deal slower 
than lung breathing, which is normally around 18 or so cycles a minute. And of course, the heartbeat, cardiovascular pulse, another rhythm that is vital for life, that's much faster. That's normally around 60, 65, 70, 75 cycles a minute, depending on how active we've been or, or how activated we are. Um, so he identified this much slower rhythm, but as he developed in his investigations, he realized that there is not only one subtle rhythm that's present within the body. There are a number of subtle rhythms that are present. And I want to just give a little bit of an overview and an introduction. He realized that there are actually deeper, slower rhythms that express through the body. Now, in explaining this, um, I'm going to um, perhaps start uh, at the top of this chart at, um, you can see, where it's written dynamic stillness. Um, and I'm going to start by perhaps exploring with you what might be at the very core, at the very essence of ourselves. Now, I'm assuming, perhaps uh, maybe not, maybe I shouldn't assume, but I'm assuming that many of you will have experienced craniosacral therapy. And many of you will have known that um, basically the um, practitioner will put his or her hands onto the patient and will often rest there fairly still for many minutes at a time. So um, and um, it, it may look from the outside that not very much is going on, but the practitioner may be tuning in to these subtle rhythms that are present within the body. And in this, way, the work is um, very, uh, very meditative. Um, and very often what will happen is that both the patient and the practitioner in this process will start to settle, will start to let go, will start to let go even more, and to drop both physiologically as well as psychologically into an experience of deep stillness. Now in craniosacral jargon, this is referred to as a dynamic stillness. Dynamic stillness refers to the fact that underneath all of our physiological functions, underneath all of our emotions, underneath all of our thoughts, underneath all of our doing, there is a state of stillness. There is a state of just being. Now, Interestingly, this is something that has been identified in many spiritual traditions, as well as many traditional forms of medicine. Um, in the Buddhist tradition, this state um, at the nature of, uh, at our own nature and at the nature of all phenomena is sometimes referred to as shunyata. It is a Sanskrit word which is often translated as emptiness. But some of the Buddhist teachers I've spoken to about this have also said, this is not a particularly good translation, that um, it also 
involves um, it, 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 that's, that some of them are used now the term spaciousness to describe this phenomena. So at the very kind of core of ourselves, at the very basis of all our mental processes, our emotional processes, as well as our physiological processes, there is this essential ground of stillness and spaciousness. And this is something that is not unusual to reconnect with when we're practicing the very kind of meditative, settling, stilling processes that we sometimes practice in craniosacral work. As I say, it sometimes happens. We put our hands on somebody, there is a settling, the nervous system starts to drop, the autonomic start to drop, the sympathetic activation starts to drop. There is a deeper letting go and then a deeper letting go. And both patient and practitioner start to experience a profound stillness. Now, why I'm saying this is that when this phenomena happens, something changes. It seems when we reconnect to this deep stillness, that is inside of us, or this deep spaciousness that is inside of us. The whole body physiology has an opportunity to start to reset and come back into normal function. So in our courses, in our trainings, we um, it, this is not something that you can, what does it say, you can't uh, direct this, you can't um, manipulate this, you can't sort of say to somebody with your hands on, okay, today we're going to go into a deep stillness, but you can create the safety, you can create the conditions, you can create the spaciousness, where quite naturally that reconnection to deep stillness might occur. And when it does occur, something changes, something gets reset. The analogy that I use these days, it's a little bit like um, to say I had some problems this morning, so this is very fresh with my emails, and um, I contacted the helpline and um, you know explained okay I've got some problem with my emails or you may have a problem with your modem what is the first thing that they always tell you to do you come on and we can talk about this what is the, what's the first thing they always tell you to do it's check your connections isn't it check your modem Go back to check your, your drive. Modem. Yeah. Check your modem. And even before that, what's the first thing they do you to do? Restart, maybe. Exactly. Check the yeah. Switch. Exactly. Switch it off. Yeah. Mm. A few minutes. Switch it back on. And that will resolve a lot of problems. Yeah. And it seems that our physiology works in the same way. If we're able to access this state of deep settling and stilling and deep letting go, things will start to reset. When we come out, we never come out in the same way that we went in. So this is one of, and I want to just emphasize, one of the therapeutic skills, the therapeutic approaches that is used in biodynamic craniosacral practice. It's one that acknowledges that at the core of ourselves and perhaps at the core of everything, 
there's a deep stillness. And when, the, when we reconnect to that, we actually reconnect to our deep source. And perhaps for a lot of us, one of the kind of profound, um, I will say, illnesses of the modern age is that we lose connection to that inherent stillness or that inherent spaciousness. We're on the go the whole time. Our nervous systems are constantly, um, you know, checking things out, scanning the environment for danger, for safety, for whatever, for the next thing that's going to make us feel better or not. And we lose touch with reconnecting to what is at our source. And we do reconnect to what is our source, then things can start to come back into play. Okay, so this is one therapeutic principle that maybe some of you have experienced. Certainly, if you come on the trainings, I would say you will experience it. This is something we'll be doing some work with. Okay, so. This also equates very much with some of the um, findings that are present within the field of quantum physics. Um, in quantum physics, it is also acknowledged that at the core of everything, the basis of everything, there is spaciousness. The atom is now considered to be 99.99999% space. The electrons that go around in the atom make up a tiny percentage of the actual um, substance that's there. In quantum physics as well, there is something referred to as the zero point field, which is considered to be at the basis of all phenomena. It's basically a state of unmanifest um, spaciousness or emptiness or stillness, which is at the basis of all forms of creation. And what seems to be happening and what, I, what I'm proposing is that it's possible through the kind of hands-on contact that we can make with craniosacral work to reconnect to that and to use that as a therapeutic principle. Now, Dr. Sutherland then also identified that it is from this inherent ground of stillness, that life starts to express itself as motion. Okay, this is one of the fundamental principles of practice. Life is expressed as motion. Okay, if we want to identify whether an organism is alive or dead, it's very simple. We have a look and we can see, is there movement? If there's movement, it's alive. If there's no movement, it's not, it's dead. But it's not just a question of black and white. Is it alive or is it dead? Maybe an organism is alive, but in some way, its movements have become compromised. And as a result of that compromised movement, the physiology, the physiology is affected. The way we function becomes compromised. Now, the first kind of most subtle rhythm or most subtle stirring of life that Dr. Sutherland identified is a very slow rhythmic movement that has become known in our profession as the long tide. It was actually given this name by one of the students of Dr. Sutherland. His name was Dr. Becker. 
And the long tide has a very slow rhythmic motion. You can see on this chart, it um, takes about a hundred seconds for each rhythmic cycle to complete. So for each breathing in and breathing out to take place, it's more than a minute and a half. So this is a, a very slow movement. The other feature of the long tide that Sutherland identified is that this is not just something that is breathing within our bodies. It's, he, he, he realized that this is actually something that takes place all around us. It's a sense of the natural world around us that breathes in and breathes out. So when we experience the long tide, we often experience it as a very wide field of function. Okay. Now this has been discussed, it's been identified by biologists, by um, various people working in, the, uh, in, in different uh, fields, different phenomena. One um, Austrian biologist, uh, was named as Victor Schauberger identified this. He went out into the forest and he started to experience the sense of the natural world around him breathing. He called this original motion. Various other biologists have been experimenting with very primitive subtle life forms called protoplasm which is a single cell organism and identifying the presence of these very slow rhythmic movements within the protoplasm, also expressing movement at 100 second cycles. If somebody can just check, somebody's got their sound on, so I'm hearing a bit of disturbance. If you can just check that your sound is off. I don't know if that's, um, yeah, I think it's gone now, thank you. Um, so, um, also, um, oceanographers have identified a rhythm. They call it the, uh, at the very bottom of the deep oceans, they call it the deep sea ocean wave, which also is a rhythmic movement that is expressed in 100 second cycles. So it takes 50 seconds for a movement in one direction. 50 seconds for a movement back. So these kinds of rhythms have been spoken about, identified and measured in other fields of practice. But this is something that Dr. Sutherland realized is also expressing not only within the world around us, but it expresses through the body and has a profound physiological function that when the long tide is able to express without restriction through the body, everything at a fundamental level is getting reanimated, re, uh, restored, reformed, rekindled, and um, maintained and healed. So some of the work that we do in biodynamic craniosacral practice involves learning skills to synchronize to this very slow, deep rhythm called the long tide and finding ways to, through that synchronization, to uh, create the conditions where it's, its expression can start to happen through the body. It's not something that uses any kind of manipulation. It doesn't use any kind of directive technique. But when the practitioner is able to start to synchronize to the presence of the long tide, this can set up a resonance for the patient's physiology and the patient's physiology through this process of resonance can start to restore its own connection to the long tide. 
So there is a range of skills that are used within biodynamic craniosacral practice that can help to set up this reconnection and resonance to the long tide. When this happens, people get better. People, you know, a whole, you know, all kinds of clinical conditions can respond. I've seen in my own practice some amazing results occur when patients have started to reconnect to this deep, profound rhythm that is perhaps our deepest expression of life and motion. Okay, let me just take a breath there. I've been talking for uh, a little while now. Um, there's a little bit more to explain. I want to talk to you about some of the other rhythms that are indicated on this chart, but perhaps I can just pause for a moment and I wonder, is there anything in what I've said so far that um, either raises questions for you or is confusing or is not clear um, or things that you would just like to share from your own experience? How are you doing, everybody? So either write in the box or, or do come online. Feel free to, 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 to dialogue with me. Um, I would like to ask a question. Great. Who is speaking? Beatrice. Ah, so, hi, Beatrice. Uh, yeah. Yes. So uh, as you ex expressed, there is this, um, from the dynamic stillness, the, uh, it is a resetting um dynamic energy which is there which is actually resetting and healing the body and keeping the body in health so uh, my question is if this resetting energy uh, why doesn't always um, heal the body it means what happens that it sometimes doesn't heal the body and what is the function of the therapist it's a great you question, my question? <laughs> okay so it's a great question. I'm going to start to answer the question now, but a little bit later, I think, in the evening, um, I might just answer a little bit more of the question. Okay. Yeah. But I think the simple answer is we become disconnected from our own nature. Okay. And that may be through stress. It may be through trauma. But we become fragmented in our function. We lose... The, the, you know, we, we, we never, we can say we never lose our wholeness. Wholeness cannot be lost. We are always whole. But we lose our experience of that wholeness. We lose our connection to it. And as a result of that, maybe we never deeply rest. Maybe we never deeply let go. Maybe we never deeply reconnect to the source of ourselves, which can also be the source of our healing and our restoration. Okay. Okay. Now, there can be many, many factors behind that. Um, there may be physical trauma. There may be emotional trauma. There may be toxicity, there may be a whole range of different factors that might disconnect us from our source. And of course, we live in a culture as well. That, um, I would say we're not taught <laughs> how to um, reconnect with that which is at our essence. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, they don't teach that in schools. Um, and there are generational um, patterns that I think that get handed down that um, also keep us in a state of disconnection and fragmentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, that's a short answer. The second part of your question was, well, why do we need a therapist? Well, the therapist can act as a kind of resource and bridge to that reconnection. That's all. Through the skillful, hands-on presence and intentions, 
and gentle facilitations that the therapist can offer through his or her hands, that can make the difference between reconnecting to this kind of deeper source of ourselves and not. Okay. Now, this is a profound question. Actually, on the trainings, we'll be looking at this question in a great deal more depth. Um, but I'm going to just say, and, and Rosa, I've seen your hand. I will come to you in a minute. Um, but um, um, there is another factor here. Why do we need a therapist? Okay. I think very often when we, uh, how, if you experience this, but when we're in our own patterns, it's very difficult sometimes to find a way out of it. But then if somebody else just kind of as a, offers us, you know, and let's say a, um, a different kind of um, connection or, or presence, um, this may make all the difference, okay? Now, um, there's a principle here, um, which I, it, it's quite a, a subtle principle, but I'll, I'll try to share it with you. Um, basically, Healing happens in relationship. Now, if we can find a relationship to ourselves, we can heal. If we can find a relationship to our health, we can heal. Actually, I think it's true that every kind of disease condition is something that happens also in relationship. Maybe it's the relationship between, let's say, your head and a car windscreen, if you have a trauma, a road traffic accident, or a relationship between your body and some, you know, poison or toxicity or poor diet, or your relationship between, you know, yourself and a primary caregiver, um, you know, who, who may not be as loving or as caring as, uh, as you may need for your physiological health. So every condition is in some ways, if we really kind of break it down, every condition in some ways is generated by some kind of relationship, yeah? And the reverse is true as well. Every kind of healing also happens within relationship. Okay. And the practitioner's skill to be able to gently facilitate the restoration of these subtle movements, Dr. Sutherland referred to them as primary respiratory motion. Yeah. And maybe I'll explain that term a, a little later if I have some time. But the practitioner's skill to be able to synchronize to these rhythms, to be able to sense, to palpate the rhythms, and to gently encourage the expression of these rhythms where it's needed, this can make the, the difference. Okay. Great, thanks. Rosa, how are you doing? Do you want to turn off your... Mike, turn on your microphone. Yes, hello. Hi. Uh, it's actually exactly on what you're, you're, you were talking about now. Um, the ability of the therapist to synchronize with this rhythm, it reminds me um, the importance of being heard. Uh, what you said about the, the relationship that it's necessary. Um, this is just something that came to my mind that how difference does it make when we are in a situation and we sending all, kind, all sorts of messages to, and we would need to be heard. And then how is it when nobody's there? And how is it when somebody is there and listens to us? and responds back to us and how this 
creates a space for for healing and changes our own rhythm and then we are yeah we are back to our temple let's say this is what came to my mind with this you're absolutely right yeah. rosa and this is another very very key therapeutic principle you know just that um, you know, just the, you know, there are a lot, uh, there's a whole range of skills that we use in craniosacral work. But you know, one of the skills, as you correctly say, just the simple presence of another person who is available, who is listening, who is neutral, who's not judging, this can make a huge difference to us to be able to resolve many of the patterns that we have. So this is a fundamental principle, um, but it's not all there is to it. I don't want to give you the impression that biodynamic practice just uses, you know, one or two skills. There is a whole range of skills, and I'm going to try and unpick and unfold a little bit more of that this evening as well. Um, but you're absolutely right. That's fundamental. Thank you. Great. Any other questions, any comments, anything in the chat box that's there, Esther, or um, um, anyone else who wants to come online? Yeah. There are a few uh, questions in the chat. Um, Helen says, I'm interested in why sleep doesn't reset us to our natural rhythmic pulse. Is it that our consciousness is necessary? Um, it's a really interesting question. Um, of course, sleep very often does, um, but not always in sleep do we fully let go. Not always in sleep are we able to fully get out of our patterns. But sleep is known to be incredibly restorative. But sleep doesn't, you know, there can still be activity that's present in sleep. It doesn't necessarily get to the specific problem that might be there. But sleep has a profound therapeutic effect and certainly the very restful um, uh, experiences that people have on a craniosacral therapy table um, uh, and that uh, when the nervous system starts to downregulate um, and come into a state of, of, of just more uh, ease, is a, stent, a state of greater ease and relaxation. This will make this also can make a big difference between us being able to process and let go of um, some of the things that we carry. Sleep will do that but it doesn't always do that. Sometimes we need to be very specific. Sometimes, for example, if I'm holding some kind of stress or strain, let's say in my heart or in my lung, it may require the practitioner to place her hands or his hands on that area to be able to work with the patterns quite specifically that are working, uh, that are present in that area in order to create the conditions for whatever it is that's being held there to resolve. Sometimes the, the general condition of sleep is not enough to do that. But let's not underestimate the therapeutic uh, power of sleep. We know, for example, now that the brain is cleansing itself in sleep. The cerebrospinal fluid is washing the brain in sleep in a rhythmic way. And this takes out a lot of the uh, kind of toxins from the central nervous system. And of course, this can have profound effects, not just on the brain, but on the whole body physiology. Thanks. That's that's really interesting. I think um, I was wondering about the uh, in receipt of craniosacral therapy, being conscious. It's like meditation that you yeah. can consciously go to that place of full relaxation, whereas in sleep, obviously, you don't have the conscious part of your brain to guide yeah. you. So I don't know. It seems like there's a sort of reciprocal um, yeah. going to that letting go place with a therapist. What? Yes, and it's an interesting one um, because sometimes 
um, we need to be conscious of it. And sometimes we don't. Um, I want to say, you know, sometimes I might have my hands on a client and, you know, something very profound shifts within their physiology. You know, it really lifts, you know, something changes. And actually we've got no idea what that was about, but we know that something has changed. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting one. And sometimes things only change when, when, when we become conscious, when we actually reconnect to whatever experience it is that's been unresolved. So it's a very, very interesting one. The, um, one of the principles of osteopathy, and remember that this work has developed out of, um, you know, it was developed initially by osteopaths and uh, it's developed out of osteopathic principles and osteopathic philosophy is that we are essentially self-healing and self-regulating organisms. One of the students of Dr. Sutherland is, I referred to him before, his name was Dr. Becker. He referred to this impulse to find health and balance as being the most powerful force in the world. We are constantly seeking health. We are constantly seeking reconnection. We are constantly seeking wholeness. Whether we're mentally or emotionally aware of that or not, we don't know. The problem is most of the time we do this in ways that are really unskillful. You know, we might drink too much or smoke too much or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but we're constantly looking for, um, you know, health and healing. We, we're all, you know, there's an intrinsic drive that is at the very root, at the very basis of our physiologies. Now, Dr. Becker referred to this as the bioenergy of wellness. And I'm using his words here. He said, the bioenergy of wellness is the most powerful force in the world. It never stops. No matter how, let's say, depressed, no matter how sick, no matter how exhausted, no matter how, you know, whatever, you know, chronic conditions you might be having, there, this impulse to find the optimal balance of whatever is possible is still going to be there it's still going to be present. So very often all that we need to do is to just allow that, is to set that free. It's not that the patient has to become, you know, consciously um, um, aware of every trauma and every pattern and every unresolved experience that they have. But very often just by, creating the conditions for deepening and reconnection, it will simply, the body will naturally try to resolve whatever it can resolve at that particular moment in time. This isn't something that the practitioner can direct or the patient can direct. And very often, the more that the patient tries to direct it and stay in touch with it, the more it can get out of the, it can get in the way. Very often, it's a question of just letting go and letting things happen naturally, allowing things to unfold in a very natural, normal way. And that this is what will actually create the conditions for healing, rather than trying to remain conscious of whatever it is that's being processed. So what I'm saying, Helen, is that um, there's, it, it seems that at different times, different things are needed. And it's about, um, it's, it, one of the skills of the practitioner is to try to synchronize to whatever is needed within that particular patient at that particular time. Sometimes we need to work with patterns in a very conscious way. We use verbal skills. We, um, you know, help people to process whatever, uh, you know, let's say stresses or traumas that remain unresolved within them. 
Um, and other times that's just not required. It's simply a question of letting go and letting things, letting the physiology unfold and naturally find its health and balance. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, it does. It's, it's, uh, it's good to hear that there's the whole spectrum. Yes, yes. Within the practice. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Great, great. Charlotte, you've raised your hand. Welcome. Yes, I did. Um, I was just uh, thinking of what happens sometimes when you have a patient who comes to you and says, well, uh, my knee is hurting terribly. I need you to do something about my knees. And as a practitioner, you're there and you can feel you can be allowed to do anything about the knee before something else has been done. Yeah, and, and this is a really interesting, yeah. This is a really interesting one and it comes up a great deal. Um, and um, one of the things that we do in biodynamic craniosacral practice is, um, this is another quote from Dr. Becker I'm going to give you. He said, whenever a patient comes into the room, there are always three things that are going on. There is the so-called expertise, the concepts, the ideas, the thoughts that the practitioner has about the patient's condition. Then there is the ideas, maybe the emotional needs, the thoughts, the expectations that the patient has about his or her own condition. And the third thing of what's going on is what is actually happening in the body physiology. And in this approach, we're always looking to listen to the body physiology and to work with that. So, this raises the kind of question that you're talking about, Charlotte. A patient may come in with a painful knee and the body physiology is saying, well, actually, I need something in my lower back to be worked with first before the knee can heal. Maybe something else has to happen as a prerequisite to the knee being able to get better. Again, this is one of the principles of osteopathic practice. It's also something that is described within many bodywork practices these days as um, biotensegrity. Everything in the body is connected to everything else. There's nothing that works in isolation. So very often it is the case, maybe there might be a twist in the pelvis or something held there. And as a result of that, a knee cartilage problem has developed over a number of years. And the patient comes in and says, you know, please come and treat my knee. Well, until you actually start addressing whatever it is that's going on in the lower back or the pelvis, you can work with the knee from now until kingdom come and you'll only get limited results. You might be able to get some symptomatic relief, but you won't get to the core of the problem. Yeah, does this make sense? Yeah, Is that, are you okay with that, Charlotte? Your sound is off, so I'm not sure what you're saying. Uh, yes, that, no, but I totally agree. That's what's happening when you have patients. So, uh, but yep. it's just surprising sometimes to, to, to feel how much the body is screaming out to you. This is what I need. Uh, yes. And, and uh, in, in, what do you call it? In, uh, on the contrary of what the, the patient says. Yes, exactly. Now, very often you can just get through this just by communicating very simply oh, to your patient. Yes. You know, so I, I might say, yeah. So I might say to the to the to the client, you know, well, look, I, I appreciate, you know, your knee is hurting, and this is why you come in. But my sense is that there's something I need to treat 
at the sacrum, first of all, or at the lower back. And once that's resolved, then I think the knee is going to be able to treat a lot, uh, you know, we can treat that a lot more easily. So usually just through a simple explanation like that, it will be fine. Um, but of course, sometimes you do need to, you know, you do need to help people with symptomatic relief. And it might be that you can put your hand on the knee, you can help to restore local motion there and help the, 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 that person um, you know, resolve some of their symptoms. That's also very valid. But we can also understand that if we want to deal with the origin of the problem, we may need to look at other things as well. Yes. Great. All right, let's see how we're doing for time. Gosh, time is flying. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the principles. Um, and then I think I'm going to open up to some more question and answers at the end and um, just talk a little bit about uh, the training as well. So I was just kind of halfway through um, talking about this chart. We um, I spoke a little bit of an introduction about the long tide, this very deep, slow rhythm that um, we can sense, we can palpate, we can synchronize to, um, and that um, when we do that, it can generate a healing process at a very deep physiological level. There is another rhythm that we can also work with, which is called the mid-tide. And the mid-tide is a sense of how these, we can say, vital forces, how the breath of life, Dr. Sutherland called them potencies, become expressed through the fluids of the body at a physiological level. So when, you know, we could say, you know, Sutherland's view of the breath of life is that it is a, a universal principle. He, he talked about the outside presence of primary respiration, the sea, the ocean of primary respiration all around us that is breathing us. So there is a kind of a universal life force that he described, but also we, are individuals, we are individual organisms. We're being fed by these, let's say, universal forces, but we are expressing these universal forces as individuated organisms. And that expression of these vital forces or potencies at a individual physiological level is what is thought to generate this other rhythm, which is called the mid-tide. The mid-tide is basically an expression of rhythmic movement that happens as a result of the potencies within the fluid of the body. Dr. Sutherland called it the fluid in the fluid. So fluid is everywhere within the body. Fluid is the carrier of the life principle within the body. As this life principle becomes expressed within the fluid, it generates another rhythmic movement, which is around two and a half cycles a minute. And this is an area where also in craniosacral biodynamics, we do a lot of work. So this is a great place. Very often on our training courses, we'll start our sessions with an orientation to the mid-tide and, and then we'll see where do we go from, from there. Um, and um, the mid-tide is basically the sense of inner breathing that takes place at, uh, within every cell, within every tissue, within every structure of the body. And if everything is breathing okay, then everything is functioning well. Those vital forces are able to express through our physiologies. Um, and at the level of the mid-tide, there is also a range of skills some of them are relatively active. Some of them involve the practitioner making, let's say, subtle invitations to his or her hands 
to help these rhythm to help get the conditions in which these rhythms can become restored and other um, skills are much more passive and involve simply synchronizing to the rhythmic movements and through that synchronization a therapeutic process can start to progress so one of the skills for the practitioner is to know when just to sit back and to allow things to happen and when maybe some kind of gentle support or encouragement may be needed through his or her hands. Now, I mentioned earlier on that in the early days, Dr. Sutherland used to use quite directive techniques. You know, he used to, you know, uh, lift cranial bones and decompress them and things like this. As he developed his skills, he realized more and more that the less invasive he was, the deeper the results he could be, the more subtle he could be with his hands on gentle facilitation and invitation of changes within the tissues, the more effective he can be. And this is also one of the hallmarks of a biodynamic uh, approach. It really has its roots in the work of uh, Dr. Sutherland's later work, which is very non-directive, non-invasive, but it may include very subtle encouragements or invitations um, through the practitioner's hands. So, okay, now let me move on. So, um, this is an image of um, sometimes of what is described in biodynamic practice of the three bodies. I, a few minutes ago, was describing these three rhythms. Um, the cranial rhythmic impulse, the um, mid-tide, and also the long tide. In this image, we basically um, see a depiction of different fields of function. The physical body is a field of function, and this is very much the domain of the cranial rhythmic impulse. If the practitioner's attention is really just focused on what is happening under the skin, then there's much more of a likelihood that the practitioner will start to feel and sense and be able to work with the cranial rhythmic impulse. The fluid body includes the field of media around the physical body. It's the sense of the fact that we don't just end at the skin. There is a field of function that extends beyond the body. It includes the body, but not limited to the body. Um, and this is the domain of the mid-tide. So when the practitioner is able to synchronize his or her attention to the whole field, it's what Dr. Becker referred to as the biosphere of the patient, this whole field, the physical body and the space immediately around the body. This is when the practitioner can then start to um, palpate and synchronize to the function of the mid-tide and to work with any um, problems or restrictions or fragmentations that might be happening um, at that level of function. And then here we can see the tidal body is this much wider field of function. It's actually a vast field of function, as I mentioned earlier, that extends all the way around us into the natural world. It's not really a personal rhythm, it's more of a rhythm of the natural world around us, but which moves through us and vitalizes us at an essential level. So in this practice we also work with what we call the three bodies, the physical body, the fluid body, and the tidal body. Each one of those bodies expresses primary respiratory motion at a different level of function. And where we need to work may be 
uh, will be dictated by whatever it is that the patient is ready to work with or needs to work with at that particular moment in time. Dana, you have a hand raise. Would you like to come on? You don't have hand raised. Okay. I write it. I write it just in the chat. Hello, I'm very glad okay. to meet you. Uh, I just tried to do why uh, how it's possible to learn biodynamics online. That's so great that uh, now the quarantine and uh, the problems yeah. with the um, yeah. sure, sure. Let me, let me come into that. And I so reg regret that I can't to yeah. come to you now. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, let me come on to that. I'm going to leave a little bit of time at the end just for talking about the training itself. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll certainly will address that question. Thank you. Yeah, great. All right. Um, okay, I'm going to just fly through a couple more slides and then I think I'll open up to other questions. As I said, there are a whole lot of written questions here that I want to try and get through. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we can become patterned by experiences that are unresolved. You know, we we may become shaped by the experiences that we have in life. And this, this starts right from the beginning of life. Actually, even a single cell, and there was a time that you and I, we were all single cells at, right at the start of life. Even a single cell is responsive to the environment. Yeah. And what is the, the primary response to stress or trauma or toxicity. It's contraction. You see this at a cellular level, even before a brain, even before a central nervous system was formed, you introduce a toxin into a cell and you will see that cell will contract. It will shut down, yeah? And so, we may become patterned by those experiences from whatever source they might be. It might be from an emotional source, a psychological source. It might be through physical trauma. It might be through a whole range of factors that start right at the very beginning of life. It might be through an unresolved birth trauma that maybe we got stuck in the birth canal there were a lot of forces of compression that were fed into the baby's physiology, not all of which have become resolved. And so we become shaped and patterned by these unresolved experiences. So in many ways, we are all, we're like walking autobiographies, which is a biography which is held within the cells, the fluids and the tissues of the body. And when we put our hands on each other, we start to listen for that kind of function, for how things are working and where things may need treating. Okay. I'm going to flick through a couple of things. So we, we might notice places of condensation or inertia, of restriction where we can put our hands and then work with these skills to gently encourage this movement to become restored. One of the principles of osteopathic practice outlined by the founder of osteopathy, Dr. Still, and this is one of the principles of craniosacral biodynamic practice, is that we are not trying to get rid of the conditions. Dr. Still wrote, to find health should be the object of physician. Anyone can find disease. Actually, it doesn't take us long if we wanna find something wrong with any of us. You know, it won't take us that long to, to find that. But in this practice, we're basically looking 
to support the expressions of health. And at a fundamental level, primary respiratory motion is an expression of health. So if we find a way to tune in to primary respiratory motion and encourage and facilitate it, this is how we can help to heal and resolve lots of conditions, okay? So this is one of the key principles of the work as well that I just wanted to name. Now, we have about half an hour left. Um, I'm just wondering what would be the best way uh, to use that. There are a whole bunch of questions. Um, I might just, what I think I'll do is I might just take you into a very short practical exercise, maybe just for five or 10 minutes. And then um, we use the rest of the time just for sort of dealing with the other questions and things that have come up. How does that sound? Yeah? All right. So just watch me first of all. Um, don't do it yet, but what I want you to do is maybe um, find a way to be able to rest your arms and to bring your hands ever so lightly onto the sides of your head. Hardly touching. Now, those of you who have experienced craniosacral work, you'll know that this is extremely light touch. So don't use any kind of pressure and don't just use your fingertips. Use the whole of your hands. Okay. And really just let your hands float. Just to float. I really don't want you feeling any kind of pressure. Make a light contact. You can make a contact through your hair. And just let your hands float and take a few minutes just for listening. See if you can let go of any agenda any need to feel anything. You can let your arms rest up if your shoulders are not too hurting. You can also, if you've got nothing to lean your elbows on, you can just hold your shoulders up for a while and maybe close your eyes. And just start, maybe notice, see if you might be able to notice your your heartbeat, your cardiovascular pulse. Maybe that's the faster rhythm of 60, 70, even 80 beats a minute. It's expressing through the little arteries in your hands, maybe in your, in your head as well. It's not always easy to feel, but maybe you can notice your heartbeat, your cardiovascular pulse. If you just run to, ca to catch a bus, that would be a lot easier because you will feel your, you can feel your heart beating in your chest more easily. But you might also be able to feel that through your hands and just identify, okay, that's, that's my heartbeat. That's my cardiovascular pulse. That's an expression of health. We don't last very long without it. As I say, it's not always easy to feel, but see, see if it comes to you just by resting and by listening and by sensing.
And then take a minute or two and see if you can sense your lung breathing. Actually, you might even be able to feel that through your hands because the accessory muscles of lung respiration can also come into the base of the skull. You might be able to feel your lung breathing even through your hands as it gently moves your hands. And that one is an easier one to feel because you can follow your lung breath. You can listen to your lung breath. So as you take a breath in, as you take a breath out, just notice, do you feel any effects of that with your hands on your head? And just identify that. Oh, okay, yeah, that's my lung breathing. That's also a rhythm, essential for health. We don't last long without our lung breathing. And then I just want you to take a few minutes just for being open to anything else that you might feel, things that you couldn't necessarily explain as cardiovascular movement or, or lung breathing, maybe something slower, maybe something even that feels underneath those first two rhythms. Maybe you feel, for example, a common experience, maybe you feel one side of your head feels a little more open and movable. The other side feels a bit denser or tighter. Or maybe you feel some kind of twisting movement or side to side movement or rhythmic movement. Just see if you can really make sure you can get as comfortable as you can. If you're sitting there or lying there really straining with your hands, then um, you're probably just going to be aware of your own tension. So just really check your sense of ease. Keep your hands ever so light. Just notice, is there anything else that I feel? Any other kind of movement? Any other kind of quality? Is what I feel in one hand, in my right hand, the same as what I feel in my left hand? Or is there some kind of asymmetry. Let me just take a couple more minutes just to be with that. If you start to get uncomfortable or if you develop a headache or anything like that, just really lighten up and back off. Just go real gentle. And this is just about listening. We're not trying to fix anything. We're not trying to do anything. 
not trying to make anything happen, but just see if you can. So every time you find yourself straining or getting tense or whatever, just, just kind of let go and, and just come back to some kind of open listening. And allow things to come to you. In a way, you're just letting information come to you. We're not looking for it. We're just letting it come to you. Okay, we'll just take another half a minute with this. And, and then when you're ready, I want you to remove your hands real slow. So don't just suddenly take them off, but just ever so slowly, just let your hands come away. Great. Okay, so when you're ready, let's just maybe hear a little bit of reflection, a little feedback around how some of you are doing. Either come online or um, write in the chat box. How are you doing? Did any of you notice any kind of difference between your left and right hands, for example? I um, I felt uh, a lot more sensation in the left than the right. Yes. Which yes. is what also happened when I had a craniosacral session the other day. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And this is very common, Helen. And so, you know, there may be one side that's a little more open and accessible and breathing a little more and something else that's not quite as open and accessible. Yeah. Great. Anyone else want to come on? I'm just gonna take another couple of minutes with this and then we'll move into um, some question and answers again. Anyone else want to share? Yes, um, I will share. Um, yeah, please come on. Yes, um, it's Rachel. I felt um, there was uh, yeah, the, the more spacious. I just explained space, um, space feeling spaciousness on the right side. Mm -hmm. um, so I could see. I was um, aware of when, because I'd felt that previously, then I was aware that then it evened out more. When right. I feel that shift. Um, yeah, so that was, that was very <laughs> interesting to feel, to feel that. Yeah, so isn't that interesting, Rachel? So just by noticing it and being with it, mm. after a few minutes, it started to change. Yes. Yes, just from that. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah. 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 And this is what I was saying, you know, sometimes things will happen like that. You know, there's nothing that the practitioner has to do 
in so to speak, for a change to take place. But sometimes the practitioner does need to be able to become a little bit more engaged or active with the process. It's very, it's very interesting, the sense of being present to that and witnessing that. Yes. And then the subtle shifts of the, of the hand. <laughs> Like yes. the hand was actually being guided and moved. Um, yes. Coming through the center of the wrist, a yes. movement yes. and a shift, very, very tiny. Yes. Um, yeah, that was very so you felt your hand adjusting to whatever it is that wanted to take place. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was. Um, Brings up questions, but yeah, I'll just explore those further. But Great. I, um, yeah, I think I'll yeah, definitely practice that again in my own time. Fantastic, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you for coming on and saying that. Thank you. Great. Okay, well, look, time is, um, you know, this is a short evening. We've, we've got, what, 20 minutes left or something like that. Um, I want to just flag a... Um, a couple of things and then we can open up to any other questions. Um, this is just an introduction, a little taster. Um, for those of you who are able with your travel, um, I am going to be teaching an introductory weekend in London in a few weeks time, that's September 25th, 26th, and this will be at our training venue. And for those people who want a kind of more in-depth introduction, which includes hands-on table work with each other, um, then this is an opportunity to do that. And then, as you may be aware, at, towards the end of October, we are starting our new practitioner training. And um, we are offering, because we have quite a few people who are interested in joining the training, but who are unable to get to London at this time because of travel restrictions and whatever, we are offering to um, be able to attend the start of the course online. Now, we've got some experience of this already. I mean, as you can imagine, um, you know, the last year and a half has been incredibly disruptive for the school because we've had to we've had trainings up and going and we've had to stop and start them and normally i mean in the you know norm in normal circumstances maybe a quarter or a third of our students come in from other countries so we had a number of students who just couldn't get to seminars when we were able to restart so we've had some pretty good experience of being able to offer them to join the seminars um, from where they are. And basically the way that'll work is um, we'll, you know, we'll be able to, uh, we'll, we, we give presentations, um, we give lectures, we then do guided practice sessions on the treatment tables. Um, obviously in the classroom, um, we've got a lot of tutors there who will be able to support the students who are in the room. Um, and the online people will give you a schedule of, we ask you if you can, to find friends or family or colleagues with whom you can practice with at designated times during the seminars. And that we will have one of the tutors will be monitoring your practice sessions. So you'll have your camera pointing towards the table. And through observation, we can also assist. Now, we found this to be very effective. We found this to work very well. There's a great deal that we can support you with, um, even if you're joining the seminars online. But we also feel that we don't want to only do an online training, that 
um, at some point, we're going to need to see you. We're going to need to put hands together with yours to, um, you know, really help to kind of, you know, check in with you. So what we're doing this year is that we're allowing um, those who want, who are unable to get to London, the opportunity to join the first four seminars online. The course consists of 11 seminars altogether. And from seminar five, we'll want to see you. And we'll want to see you for at least five of the remaining six seminars, or is it five of the remaining seven seminars? Um, so that's basically how it's going to work. Um, and um, this has been how we've, we're just about to finish a training group at the moment, quite late because of all of the delays that we've had to have with COVID. And there have been a number of international students who we've been able to quite effectively train in this way. Um, there were also questions around, well, what about those people who are meeting in London? You know, what are the COVID considerations around that? Um, and just to say that we are basically following a range of COVID protocols. Um, so, for example, um, obviously, if, you know, we're screening people, if anybody has any kind of symptoms, then, you know, we ask them not to be present. We take people's temperature at the start. Normally on training courses, I encourage people to work with as many different people, um, put hands on as many different people on the training courses. But whilst COVID is around, I'm encouraging you just to find a partner for that seminar and stay with that partner on that seminar so that you're not, as it were, mixing around the group too much. So that if something, if somebody does go down with an infection, then at least it's not too easy spreading around the class. Um, we are keeping social distancing, we're spacing the tables, we're spacing the um, positions of people within the room. Um, and this is basically how we've been working over the last months, you know, during the courses that we've been running. Um, just doing whatever we can to support the safety of everybody there. Um, it's not foolproof. Nobody, you know, nobody knows. I mean, who, you know, we can't guarantee anything in this, um, <laughs> in these strange circumstances that we're all in. Um, but we are certainly reducing risks in that way. Um, we're also asking practitioners, unless they feel some kind of exemption, to be wearing a face mask when they're working. Um, and, um, and clients can also, when you're working, when you're receiving a session, you can also be wearing a face mask. Although if we're working on particular areas of the head or face, it might not be appropriate. But we're using face masks and visors, which the school is providing, as appropriate and as needed for participants in the classroom. So that's basically how we're adapting our trainings um, to meet the current needs. Any questions around that? Okay, so I'm gonna just um, also flick on um, the practitioner training. Um, it has 48 days of classroom attendance. Um, there's 11 seminars that run approximately every two months. Each seminar is four to five days in length. Um, we teach a broad range of skills. There's a lot of supervision in class. We keep a tutor to student ratio of one tutor for four students at all times on the training. So there's always tutors who can assist, who are available, experienced practitioners to come and work with you. The tutors themselves will be wearing masks or visors as they're working. And I think that these protocols are likely to be in 
you know, then it's likely to be in, um, you know, operative for at, let's say at least another six months or so. Um, so, you know, we'll be taking all um, precautions that we can on that basis. Um, we do also, we, it's not a requirement that people are vaccinated in order to come on the course. We don't want to make that a clear requirement, but we do encourage students to take lateral flow tests, antigen tests on the day before each seminar and also um, the day after each seminar and during if, if needed. And we do have some of those tests also on site um, if that's needed during the classroom time. Um, there's home study between the seminars. Um, I won't take too long to, uh, to just maybe to, 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 um, um, to, to go into too much detail, but we ask you to practice the skills that you're learning in the seminars between the different seminars. We ask you to find volunteer clients at home or different students can meet up in between the seminars if there are people who are living in your area. And we ask you to give feedbacks about some of those home, those home practice sessions so that that's one way that you stay in communication with us about how you're getting on and how you're applying the skills. We also have a teaching clinic that we ask students to attend during the second year of the training. And this is a really unique facility. It runs in London, very close to the training school. Um, and you're given a lot of one-to-one -one supervision at the teaching clinic. Um, we have different requirements for attending the teaching clinic according to prior clinical experience. And um, that's something that's always discussed at interview, so you know exactly what you would be involved with um, if you do come on to the training. We have highly experienced teachers. We've got some leading teachers in the program coming in, um, uh, starting in October. Um, I've been teaching for 30, 35 years. Um, one of my colleagues, Fatima, has been teaching for 20 years. Another one of my colleagues, Jim File, is going to be teaching. He's been teaching um, for about 40 years. He's one of the, um, really been learning from some of the founders of, of this work as well. Um, we have lots of creative and interactive ways of being able to present the material. Tutors are available between the seminars. I've already mentioned that people can attend the start of the course online. Um, and really the intention of the training is to create a really good comprehensive foundation for professional practice. Um, and, um, and that's basically what we're, what we're doing. Um, so yeah, so I think that's, um, that's basically it. Um, I'm gonna just run through some of the questions that were written. Um, somebody said, what is the average class size? Normally we would go to the late twenties. This year, we would probably stay at a maximum of 24 in order to maintain social distancing, okay? We would aim for around 20, um, but we would go to a maximum of 24. Um, how is the clinical experience, hands-on experience assessed and measured? Well, as I mentioned, um, when for those people who are in class, um, the tutors will come around, we'll put our hands together with yours um, through observation and also through working directly with you when you're on the tables, is when we get to know how you're doing, we get to support um, and help you to make any kind of corrections or adjustments. When those people are online, that'll be done through um, through your video camera, through observation, and also through dialogue, through um, engaging you in feedback and dialogue as you're working and after you're working. How are students' personal health issues that may arise during practice managed? E.g. safe space, confidentiality, impact of energy healing, on an individual and of around one study. 
there's a great deal of um, attention that we play to this. First of all, confidentiality is sacrosanct. Safety on the courses is sacrosanct. Um, obviously, we do a lot of work. Uh, you know, students are doing a lot of practice sessions on the on the seminars, and it does happen that things come up. You know, if there is some deep-seated, let's say, birth trauma. Um, it may come up during a training seminar. There are very highly skilled and experienced tutors who can assist and help people to rebalance and to process things when they're in the training course. But we also ask you, everyone on the training, whether you're joining online or whether you're joining in person, to have a craniosacral practitioner who you can go to if you do get into trouble. It might be that um, something comes up for somebody in a training course and, you know, there might be tutors who can help you to work with that and to process it. But, you know, as we all know, some of our deep-seated patterns may need work over a period of time. So we do ask you to receive a minimum of 10 treatments from a qualified practitioner during the two-year training, um, but also that you can go to see somebody should you get into any difficulty on the training um, and need any kind of ongoing work. So there's a lot of support that's given both in class, but we also encourage you to have resources and support out of the classroom, okay? Um, what type of written work is required, e.g. essays, exam format? Um, well, the major written work is around feedback around your practice sessions. There are a few reflective questions. There's no big essays that we ask you to do, and there's no big thesis. We actually dropped that years ago. Um, we find that, we, that it's much more relevant and important that the, 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 it's the practice that's important rather than just writing up academic um, theories. Um, so we ask you to give feedback around your practice sessions. We ask you to do what we call a case history project during the second year of the course. There's reading to do. Um, there's a bit of anatomy study to do. So we ask you to look at particular um, parts of anatomy that we're working with on the training. Um, there's there is a, both a practical assessment and a written exam at the, towards the end of the course. The practical assessment is where you would work on one of the tutors and we'd ask you to demonstrate some of the, the basic skills, some of the core skills. The written exam, before too many of you start freaking out, is a take home open book exam that you self time. OK, so it's not an exam that you do at the school. We give you exam questions. We ask you to self time. It's a three hour paper. You can have all your textbooks open, all of your course notes open. The purpose of the exam is not to test your short term memory, but to test your understanding and how you can access information, which is basically what you need when you're in clinical practice. Testing your short term memory has really limited benefit. OK, so it's really not a, you know, I mean, it's something you have to do, but we, you know, it, let's say it, it's as least stressful as possible. You can choose the time when you do it. Uh, um, one, you know, towards the end of the course, you're given a window in which you need to complete it, and you do it on trust. You time yourself. We figure if you cheat and you take five hours instead of three hours, we figure well, primarily you're cheating yourself. You're not just cheating us, as it were. But it's done on trust, um, and it's a really good kind of just way of for you to be able to kind of evaluate yourself and to check, well, you know, what do I understand by this practice? So 
The graduation is really done on a whole range of all of these things. It's not just loaded up on the exam at the end of the course. It's really through ongoing participation, through your submission of the, your, your feedbacks and the home study. Um, and we get a pretty good idea, I want to tell you, you know, pretty quick, you know, where people are struggling and who may need more support in certain areas. Um, and, and we're very used to doing that. Can you give us an example of a typical teaching day schedule? Um, yeah, typically um, there's at least two table practice sessions each day. There'll be a lecture, presentation, demonstration of skills, and then people go onto the treatment tables to practice. So the day, it's, it's kind of interspersed with both theory and practice. There's a lot of practical work that's involved on each seminar. Um, okay, um, there's a couple of questions around the practice itself. Um, how am I doing? My God, I'm overrunning for time. I don't mind going on an extra five or 10 minutes if you don't mind. Um, but um, any questions from your side? Let me just open it up and then maybe I'll pick up on one or two other questions that have been written to me. Yeah, Rosa. Yes, uh, my question is if you have, um, if you believe it's possible for one that uh, has a full time job uh, together with um, a living anatomy course, yes. uh, plus the, the training of the two years, do you think it's possible? Yeah, I mean, many yeah. people have done that, Rosa. I yeah. mean, it's a very individual thing. I'm, I'm really happy to talk to you about you know, what would be involved and what suits you. Mm. Um, but certainly we've had people who are in full-time employment and who have been doing both courses at the same time and have okay. been managing it. Yeah. But it's really a question, you just need to be involved. Uh, sorry, you just need to be aware of what's involved. Obviously the yeah. attendance is important. You need to be able to take that time out. Um, yeah. We can catch people up through giving some um, tutorials if they have to miss a day or a sem but but you know ideally we we don't want to do that ideally we want to you know we want people to feel that they can attend um you know the, the full course if, even if they have to you know sometimes people have to miss little parts if they get sick or something happens then we find yeah. ways of catching up um the home study from the practitioner training you know include we ask you to to practice an average of two practice sessions a week on average yeah. Um, yeah, and each of those practice sessions may be 45 minutes or something like that in length. Um, we probably, you know, a conservative estimate is that your home study and practice on the practitioner training would be around three and a half, four hours a, a, a week, something like okay. that. Yeah. Now, if you're doing the living anatomy course at the same time, then it's probably about the same amount for the living anatomy course. Now, yeah. some people do more, some people do less. Um, but if you can dedicate that time um, and you have the interest and the motivation from our side, that's no problem. You're most welcome. Thank you. Yeah, great. Anything else? Anything in the chat box, Esther, that um, you can see that I should try to um, speak about? I have answered a few practical questions. Um, I don't think there's anything else. Mary, Mary, Mary Ed says, um, about how does it work with getting if, if you live alone and you need people to practice on um, you know how how is that kind of thing arranged? Yes, um, I mean it's not usually an issue. Um, obviously, we appreciate particularly these days people don't want to be mixing too much. But um, you know, I have to say our prior experience is that. 
you know, you mention, oh, I'm on a craniosacral therapy training and you'll get, you know, people volunteering left, right and center. Oh, yes, I want to be your practice client. I want to be your guinea pig. Um, sometimes where people have had difficulties with that, they've even just put an advert out in their local news agent or in their local newspaper and said, you know, practice clients wanted, um, you know, to, as I'm going through this training. Um, so there are various ways of being able to find clients. Um, and, um, and obviously, if you're working with people who you don't know so well, then you may need to screen those clients. Um, but quite honestly, in the many, many years that we've been running these courses, um, some people have had some concerns of, oh my God, how am I going to find clients? But it's never actually been an issue in practice. Everybody's managed to sort that out, whether it be friends, family, work colleagues, acquaintances, or even having to go to people who you don't know. Um, Michael, my, my specific question there was, was about my understanding. Is it necessary that you would have to have clients in real time alongside? Oh, I see. Um, it's thoroughly recommended. Um, so um, if you can, sorry, May Reed, if I didn't get the question correct. Um, it's thoroughly recommended um, because then you can do practices in real time along with the rest of the students live with the tutors. We also understand and we've had through our Zoom experiences over the last year or so that not every student who's attending on Zoom can manage that for all of the sessions. But I would certainly ask you to do what you can on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great. Anything else, Esther? No, not, nothing else at the moment. Okay, great. I mean, there are some other questions. I'm going to touch on them if I can, just even in one word answers. Um, what is the role of fascia in CST? Well, we work with fascia a great deal. As I mentioned, craniosacral therapy is such a bad name. You know, it was named after this system of tissues and fluids at the core of the body. I mean, it, you know, that Dr. Sutherland identified, but it really is a whole body, whole person approach. It really works with, with very much with the fascia, with the viscera, with the organs, um, with, with the bones of the arms, uh, you know, of, of the, the, the legs as well, uh, everything. So, um, and, and we actually have a whole seminar that is pretty well dedicated to working with fascia. It's an important element and we learn how to tune into the movements within the fascia and learn skills to work with the fascia. How does the autonomic nervous system respond to craniosacral work? Well, it responds in a number of different ways. I've referred a little bit to that during the talk already, um, that there can be as soon as we start to come in relationship with each other, as soon as we start to touch, the autonomic nervous system can be affected. The autonomic nervous system is deeply affected also by the function of the fascia. We now know that the fascia, for example, contains such a huge amount of sensory nerve endings that feed back into the autonomics. Um, we also work with particular autonomic nerves. We work with the organs, the viscera, and the autonomic nerve connections between the viscera. We also work with very directly with the nuclei, the origins of the autonomic nerves that occur at the base of the head. So the major nerves, so the vagus nerve, which is the major parasympathetic nerve, and so involved in, in so many functions, uh, we do a lot of work with the vagus, but also the other autonomic nerves that um, are, um, also have their origins at the, uh, at the brainstem. So we have a number of ways in of working with the nerves. We also work with the spinal nerves um, that, um, and the sympathetic nerves that um, go either side of the spine, the sympathetic nerves, which will very often become activated in states of uh, stress or distress or trauma. So there are many, many ways of influencing autonomic nervous system function. I also want to say that 
the training also incorporates a lot of the work that has been developed within the field of trauma over the last 20 years or so. Um, some of the pioneers within the field of trauma have taught at our school, people like Peter Levine, Stephen Porges, um, uh, Babette Rothschild, Bessel van der Koop, they've all run workshops and seminars for us. Um, and we've incorporated a lot of the findings of um, body-oriented um, approaches to working with trauma into our curriculum and also support that through the appropriate use of verbal skills where that's needed. So we learn how to help our clients um, access the resources that they may need in order to process trauma and also the resources to be able to stay with um, a sense of their own uh, body sense sensation, which is also found to be a really useful skill and um, 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 uh, prerequisite to us being able to safely and effectively process unresolved trauma. Now, I'm summarizing this in a way that really doesn't do it justice, but I just want to flag that we do um, incorporate a lot of trauma skills into the training pretty well from the first seminar we start exploring and addressing and looking at how we can work with um, those kind of states of traumatic imprint and overwhelm and activation. Um, okay, well, I think that's covered most of the questions. Um, I know there are a couple of questions I probably haven't covered yet. Um, please do feel free to write those in if you feel that you, whatever it is you need hasn't been addressed. You can write it into Esther and we'll give you a written response or even have a quick conversation with you if you feel that there's something you need to know um, in order to support your understanding or um, to help you make a decision as to whether or not this is an appropriate training for you. Um, I think I'd just like to leave it there. I don't want to go on too much. I think we've overrun quite a bit already. Um, but I do really want to thank you for your participation, for your interest, for your engagement. Um, I hope it's been interesting. I hope it's been useful for you. Um, I do hope that some of you will be able to join us and that we'll be able to go into this work in a lot more depth. Just to remind you, there is an opportunity for an introductory weekend at the end of September. Um, if, uh, if you have a chance to join us there, it'll give you a, a much more of an experiential sense of, uh, of the practice. Um, but please do feel free to stay in touch. Um, so big, big thank you for your interest. Um, big thank you also to Esther for her wonderful work as our administrator and also for holding the background here, um, you know, doing all the IT for this uh, talk this evening. Um, and uh, just to really wish you well, whichever part of the world you're in, be well, stay safe. And uh, I hope we have the chance to be able to explore this further. So thank you.